It is 8 o'clock, and I would like to welcome all of you to uh, the third Presidential University Lecture. Uh, this lecture series was created last fall to showcase members of the Iowa State University faculty who are internationally regarded as leaders in their disciplines and who are also able to lecture on topics of general interest to students, faculty, and the broader Ames community. The purpose of the lecture series is really twofold. Uh, first of all, it is to highlight the excellence of our faculty here at the university, but at the same time to provide informative and stimulating lectures for the entire university community. Last year, we had two great lectures, the first by distinguished professor Max Rothschild, and the second by distinguished professor of family and consumer sciences, Diane Burt. The lecture series is supported by the Miller Endowment that was created by the estate of F. Wendell Miller, and also the Iowa State University Committee on Lectures, funded by the government of the student body. Uh, before I introduce Ben Allen, who will introduce tonight's speaker, I would like to recognize uh, one person, if she hasn't stepped too far away, the person who's constantly responsible for these great lectures that we have at Iowa State. We work so hard behind the scenes to make these happen, and that's Pat Miller. Pat, uh, would you step forward so we can all thank you and recognize you. Pat works with the broader university community and with our students to arrange lectures, and she has to deal with uh, comments by people on Michael Moore and Ann Coulter and all the other kind of lectures that we have at the university, but it's what really creates a very stimulating environment for all of us. I'd like to now introduce uh, Dr. Benjamin Allen, uh, provost of the university and vice president for academic affairs, who will introduce tonight's lecturer. Ben. Good evening. It is indeed my pleasure this evening to introduce the speaker for the Paul Presidential University Lecture, Professor Charles Bradley Schrader. Dr. Schrader is professor of management in the College of Business. He is nationally recognized for his expertise in strategic management and business ethics. His major research interest in the study is the study of the relationships of formal uh, strategic planning and corporate social responsibility for company performance. He serves on the editorial boards of several management journals. His commitment to an extraordinary success in teaching and the scholarship of learning have been recognized both here and across the nation. He was awarded the Iowa State University Foundation Award for Outstanding Achievement in Teaching in 1998. He won the Philip G. Hubbard Award for Outstanding Education, an award given to one faculty member in all three regional universities. He has written many case studies on issues dealing with business ethics and other parts of management, and several of his case studies have won the award Classic Case Distinction by the Case Research Journal. Dr. Schrader has written extensively on the subject of business ethics and was one of the two inaugural co-directors of the Moral G. Bacon Center for Ethics in Business at Iowa State. Dr. Schrader has extensive experience in working with corporations and in, in executives and with international organizations. Let me give you a few examples. He served as an instructor on business ethics at the Iowa School of Banking, he facilitated a session, a few sessions for Optimum. You may not remember that, but that is the Pioneer Hybrid DuPont Joint Venture, which led to other arrangements. And he has worked with Pioneer Hybrid on a number of other occasions. He's taught executive development programs in ethics with the Board of Directors, Mary Greeley Health Center, and Bankers Trust in Des Moines. And he's made presentations and taught courses in Egypt, Ukraine, Czech Republic, England, and other countries. 
Dr. Schrader has also provided outstanding leadership and service to ISU. As noted earlier, he served as the co-director of the Bacon Center for Ethics and Business. He served, I know this personally very well, as the department chair for the Department of Management and Marketing. And he served as chair of the board of directors of the ISU Center for Excellence in Teaching, now known as the Center for Excellence in Learning and Teaching. And he has served on and chaired many university and college committees. Dr. Schrader earned a BS degree in sociology and a master's of public administration from Brigham Young University and an MBA and a PhD in management from Indiana University. He joined Iowa State University in 1984 as an assistant professor and has worked himself up to the full professor rank. It's easy to understand why President Joffrey selected Professor Schrader to be the third presidential university lecturer. The university lecture series was designed to highlight faculty excellence in learning, discovery, and engagement. Professor Schrader is doing research that is nationally recognized, providing exceptional education to the next generation of business leaders, and providing extraordinary leadership in the area of business ethics. It is my pleasure to introduce my longtime colleague in the College of Business, Brad Schrader. President Joffrey, Dr. Allen, distinguished colleagues, family, friends, I'm deeply honored to have this opportunity to speak. <clears throat> so profound and deep is the honor that I feel that I hope that, that I, and I believe that it would be almost unfair and unethical for me to be honored like this any time again in the near future. <laughs> but thank you, uh, Dr. Allen, for those very kind words. I'd also like to extend a special uh, statement of gratitude to the many students who are here. Uh, you honor me with your presence. Many of you are probably wondering what, what I'm, I am doing at this podium, presuming to address you as the presidential lecturer. I assure you no one is more surprised by this presumption than I. When President Joffrey asked me to speak about business ethics, I was not sure that there were many who were interested in the topic, but I can tell by the attendance here this evening that there certainly is. And uh, quite frankly, it's a bit overwhelming. I'd like to thank you all for being here. Even though tonight I'm going to talk about business ethics, this will not be an exercise in business bashing. It's a noble thing to create a business, a company, an organization that creates wealth for shareholders, useful products for consumers, jobs, and value to society. I do, however, plan to attack the ways we teach, theorize, and the assumptions we make about business ethics. And I will be asking you to re-examine re some of the assumptions you might hold. Socrates said, the unexamined life is not worth living. So let's do examine the current context for ethics and business. Let us look at both the mistakes and the successes. Let's think about how ethics is manifest in current business practice and how business ethics is taught in business schools. We seem to have been bombarded with recent acts of wrongdoing. Fraud at Enron, Health South, Stu Leonard's Dairy, Global Crossing, now Marsh and McLennan, Insider trading at Solomon Brothers and Martha Stewart, conflict of interest at Disney and Tyco, Margie Arnabisco, and out now simple greed at Adelphia. Yet for every bad guy, there seems to be a saint. For example, Merck's generosity in donating Mectazan to cure river blindness in the 1990s worldwide. Merck is in a bit of trouble now, but I suspect they will get through this. Medtronic's, exempl Medtronic's exemplary balanced governance structures, Judy Wicks and the White Dog Cafe's aggressive stance toward community development in inner city Philadelphia. Therefore, we do not necessarily need to ask who is to blame, but rather what is going wrong and what is right. What can we learn from the fiascos? What were they thinking? What were the prevailing assumptions about business? And how can we prevent Enron from happening again? How can we prevent the harms from happening again? How can we improve? We need to fundamentally change how we teach and think about business. 
We tend to hold wrong and dangerous assumptions about business and teach cold and detached theories in our classrooms. In an open letter to business school deans that appeared this summer in the AACSB publications and websites, as well as in the Journal of Business Ethics and in most, most newsletters uh, of the major academic professional associations, including the Academy of Management June 2004 new newsletter, it states that current business degree programs tend to foster a mean-spirited and distorted view of human nature, a narrow, outdated, and repudiated notion of ethics, an overly reified conception of the sub-disciplines of management, and a sense of learned helplessness and hopelessness among faculties. These assumptions must change for the state of business ethics to change. I will attempt to address these issues tonight. My goal is to weave a seamless collage in the search for business ethics. That was my little tribute to uh, Jim McElroy, who can't be with us tonight because he's teaching in Des Moines, my mentor. Henry David Thoreau wrote, for every thousand hacking at the leaves of wrongdoing, there is one striking at the root. Tonight, I presume to search for these roots. This talk is an attempt to strike at those roots. The causes of recent moral lapses in business are conceptual and theoretical and they lie first within business schools and within business disciplines. Since the problems are theoretical, the solutions are also. Consequently, we must work on the roots. I want to start in the classroom. Two years ago, I was leading a discussion on a case with Master of Business Administration students on a Saturday afternoon in September. The course was Management 501 Strategy Formation, a required MBA module. The subject, competitive strategy. The assignment was a Harvard Business School case about Walmart, the huge discount retailer, the penultimate example of the generic strategy referred to as overall cost leadership. The case was designed to illustrate the concepts pioneered by competitive strategy guru Michael Porter. With enough information to analyze the discount retailing industry and to understand the competitive position of Walmart, a juggernaut. Everything was set up, the perfect case about the perfect strategy. Predictably, class discussion proceeded with students making good observation about Walmart's power over suppliers and their large and growing market share, their internal cost containment practices second to none. But as we continued discussing the case, I noticed a rather strong undercurrent of discontent. As we delved deeper into the case, student comments became coupled more and more with qualifications and hesitations, such as, well, sure, they're smart, sharp negotiators, but they're too heavy-handed and mean. They say they buy American, but will switch to a foreign supplier at the drop of a hat if they don't get the price concessions they want. I work for a company that supplies products to Walmart, and they constantly squeeze us. They're the mother of all squeezers. I deal with some small businesses in small Iowa towns affected by Walmart's hegemony, don't they see any problems with infinite incremental growth? Is there no room for the small differentiated pharmacy or hardware store anymore? These responses fascinated me. Here was Walmart, the epitome of cost leadership, Fortune Magazine's most admired firm, a Harvard case example of a good strategy, so it had to be true. But integrity said that I had to let the case discovery process work. So I attempted to explore more deeply, and soon there were expressions of outright anger. This wonderful firm, Walmart, was seen by these experienced Saturday MBAs as a little heavy, kind of mean, plodding, and simply unattractive, but good at cost leadership. To be sure, Walmart was not seen as evil, nor was anything deemed inherently unethical about their strategy. But the students were clearly and genuinely disturbed by the fact that this firm had overwhelming influence over all interorganizational transactions, the firm managers would outwardly, outwardly claim to hold a set of values, yet would abandon the stated values for even the smallest market gain, and the firm would, in effect, attempt to appear to be something it really was not. But it tells us it is friendly, and sometimes it is a ruthless competitor. The session and case ended, but the discussion never really did. Walmart examples surfaced from time to time during the remaining meetings and in other classes, and the concern never really seemed to fade away. Following this, on the cover page of the October 6, 2003 issue of Business Week, 
the question was posed, is Walmart too powerful? The authors of the article observed that even though Walmart's prices are great, there are sometimes problems for workers, suppliers, and communities. Essentially the same observation as the students. Over time and upon reflection of many similar instances, I decided that though there's nothing necessarily wrong with Walmart, there may be something deeply wrong with some of the assumptions both the company and we, in general, make about business and business people and the effects business decisions have on people. We need to examine these assumptions and challenge most of them. We tend to conceive of business and ethics as separate standards. I cannot tell you how many times I've heard the jab, hey, you teach business ethics, isn't that an oxymoron? And then I have to laugh and act like that's the first time, yeah, that's great, that's funny, first time I've heard that today. It's no more an oxymoron than military intelligence and it's least if not a redundancy such as criminal lawyer. <laughs> and if you already sense a little bit of anger and defensiveness in me, well, you're correct. The defensiveness stems from years of teaching a subject that's considered to be an add-on, if we have time. Doesn't really fit, so let's give it to management, subject in business schools. But while in reality is perhaps the most fundamental topic for business schools. In truth, then, every case becomes an ethics case. Every strategy should be examined for its implications for human welfare. Ethics and business are interconnected and are the same thing because business is about adding value and ultimately about doing what is good and right. Separating the two is, in my mind, the biggest problem in business. How many times have you heard someone say, this is not an ethical decision, it's just a business decision? This is a flawed and dangerous assumption. Business and ethics, the two are not, should not, and cannot be separated. Laura Nash, who teaches business ethics at the Harvard Business School, states business ethics is the study of how personal norms apply to the activities and goals of commercial enterprise. It is not a set of separate standards, but considers how the business context poses its own unique problems for the moral person who acts as an agent of the system. Therefore, really, business ethics is no more or less about ethics than bioethics or engineering ethics, ag ethics, name your discipline. The view that business and ethics are separate standards, in my opinion, is the major problem we face in business and in business schools. If they are viewed as separate by the business community, it is an inevitability that businesses will operate accordingly. If they are viewed as separate in academe, then ethics will be devalued and repudiated in theory and teaching. This is not good. Many, most, if not all the major crises we've experienced over the past decade in business are the result of flawed assumptions about business and ethics. In my view, these crises have common themes. First, they involve they involved attempting to look good before or without really trying to be good. They also involve a tyranny of the bottom line, shareholders only versus stakeholders. They are examples of a triumph of self-interest over the common good and a triumph of egoism over humility. And third, they are about manipulating transactions but not about adding value or building relationships. In other words, wrong assumptions and wrong theory. Looking good versus being good. When I was 11 years old, with the help of an older friend, I was able to purchase some illegal fireworks called M80s. M80s are powerful firecrackers that are about an inch and a half long with a fuse in the middle and were definitely illegal in my hometown of Lincoln, Nebraska. But I bought them and used them to impress my friends with their incendiary capabilities. On one occasion, in order to show off, I demonstrated the M80s awesome power in front of the neighbor kids by blowing up a garbage can in an alley about two blocks from my home. I told my friends to stand back while I lit the thing, put it in the can, and then raced off a safe distance on my bike to observe the fun. Now let me tell you, an M80 will take out a garbage can. In this case, it blew out the bottom of the can and sent the lid swirling about 15 feet into the air, and it was loud. We raced away on our bicycles. To make a long story short, someone in the neighborhood recognized one of the kids with me who turned out to be their paperboy. 
Within just an hour or two of combined neighborhood and police detective work, I was identified as the culprit. <laughs> I still vividly remember the police officer walking up to the front porch of my house and recall in detail the confrontation. My father and I were on the porch. The officer was a friend of my dad. My dad was a city firefighter. He knew many of the police officers because he worked at the main fire station. And I recall in detail the conversation as the officer walked up. It went like this. Hey, Chick. That was my father's nickname. Hey, Norby, what's up? Well, Chick, looks like your boy has a little of the old man in him. <laughs> oh, yeah, what'd he do? I proceeded to confess and to express clear but feigned remorse. I was lectured on the dangers of illegal fireworks, and my father assured the officer that the garbage can would be replaced that very day. And that very day, I did extensive research at the various hardware stores in Lincoln and purchased with my own money the best replacement garbage can on the market. My father also made sure I apologized to the can victim. This was all done prior to discussing my punishment options. I was grounded for a while. But the real story behind this is that while the police officer was at my home, I made the following officer offer. I made this offer. I said, sir, I have another of those nasty M80s in my room. Maybe I should give it to you so I won't be tempted to get into any more trouble. He said that would be a good idea, and I went to my room to, reti to retrieve an M80. Truth was, I had a whole drawer full of them. <laughs> but I wanted to appear remorseful and reproved, so I handed one over. Now, before this story gets totally out of hand, let me assure you that my mother quickly figured out I had more M80s, and my second grounding was the mother of all groundings. <laughs> and please know that my wife and family already know this story. They hear it almost every family reunion. So you cannot surprise them with expressions of disgust. In this instance, in this mundane little story, I wanted to look good without really being good. It was almost natural. Yet remember, I was 11 years old. This is something we expect to grow out of as we get older, correct? Certainly we don't expect it of adults, or do we? The problem of form over substance is an ancient one, certainly a long-standing issue in business, as well as in government, sports, and in society in general. The looking good versus being good dynamic is similar to Harry Potter's search for the sorcerer's stone. As Harry struggles to find the stone, he's tempted by his own image, one that is literally implanted on his forehead, and he's forced to make difficult choices among being loyal to self, friends, school, and family. He makes some impulsive choices along the way, but eventually learns the true value of loyalty, friendship, and integrity. Understanding the dynamic of looking versus being is important, and the examination of the dynamic is certainly needed now as much as any time in our history. For example, current political ads seem to be more devoted to image and posturing than to message content. The result is that when all, all that matters is image, ethics takes a back seat. But ultimately, we realize we really want and need the substance. Enron is, again, a good, bad example. In 2001, Enron managers met with the lenders in New York to analyze its deterior deteriorating situation. At that meeting, Enron reports indicated it had $13 billion of debt on the balance sheet, but another $38 billion was off balance sheet. Anyone looking at Enron from the outside would see a debt-to-equity ratio of about 70%, but add the off-balance sheet debt, and the ratio went to over 250%. Now, I'm not an accountant or a sophisticated financier, but I certainly do hope that most companies do not understate their debt by a factor of four. And I hope they don't hide their financial details in arcane off-balance off, off sheet footnotes. This is fraud, legal or not. The idea that a set of financial statements and disclosures is to fairly reflect the financial situation and condition of a company seems to have gone out the window in favor of trying to look good to investors. At Enron, the impetus for looking good came from the top. Listen carefully to this paragraph from the foreword of the Enron Code of Ethics, dated July 2000, signed by Ken Lay. We want to be proud of Enron and to know that it enjoys a reputation of fairness and honesty 
and that it is respected. Gaining such respect is one aim of our advertising and public relations activities. But no matter how effective they may be, Enron's reputation finally depends on its people, on you and me. Let's keep that reputation high. Well, Enron was indeed flying too high on borrowed wings. To me, their credo is backward. It is PR first and action second. Rather, respect should be the aim of everyone in the company, and the PR department simply tells the story. Research on executive failure by Sidney Finkelstein reported in his book titled Why Smart Executives Fail finds that one of the major causes of system-wide failure is an executive's obsession with company image. Enron is an expensive example. Looking good versus being good. Appearance matters. In many cases, it's all that matters. Look at the societal forces at work. We have radical makeovers for both people and houses. We have swans and nip-tuck. Plastic surgeons are heroes on entertainment TV. Implants and liposuction are the norm. We want bigger cars, TVs, houses, and burgers. More of everything. For example, International Truck and Engine Corporation is currently producing the world's biggest production pickup truck. At 14,500 pounds, 21 and a half feet in length, it can tow 20 tons and get seven miles a gallon diesel. But most important, it makes the Humvee look like a girly car. <laughs> More is better, just what we need. Very much in tune with today's realities. The same forces are manifest in business. Pressure to look good for Wall Street cajoles managers into corporate liposuction, restructuring and layoffs, and plastic surgery, cooking the books, off-balance sheet reporting. And while sometimes these activities are necessary, and even though they are often within the law, they can give rise to unethical rationalizations, such as deeming certain situations where it's okay to cheat, and CEOs saying that they're responsible for the outcomes that they like, and the ones that look good, but not for the ones that don't. Enron is a fascinating case, because it involved these very forces. Let me offer some insights from an Enron employee who was an MBA student in a class that I taught last summer. This MBA student viewed the primary cause of Enron's downfall to be its, it, to be its corrupt performance review methods, which he called the rank and yank system. He said, you had to be a deal maker. The more deals you made, the better. And you were ranked solely on the quantity and size of deals. And this led to some very risky and non-transparent activities. Compensation was all based on short-term criteria, and there was no follow-up to check on the authenticity of transactions. We were all caught up in the frenzy, and so were outside investors. It was great to read about how smart we were. The market was rewarding every move we made. We got to the point where we believed we were bulletproof. Everybody loved us. The looking versus being problem has forced some pretty good outcomes on us, however. We now have, for example, renewed interest in corporate governance in extracting full responsibility from boards and top managers, in representing shareholders, and in transparent reporting of company results. The Sarbanes-Oxley Act now requires CEOs to certify financial disclosures and requires firms to establish codes of ethics. Still, I believe Enron scared us. In the early go, Enron was the poster child for corporate growth in every textbook and on every buy list. But its financial shenanigans were so complex that few could figure them out. The main thing I understand about Enron's risky hedging activity packages, called Raptors, was the comment made by Bethany McLean of Fortune magazine, there was no there there. But as scary as Enron was, I think the word ethics tends to scare us more. Ethical issues are complex and sometimes confusing. And because of this, we get turned off or we give up. But we must not give up. Sharon Watkins, Enron whistleblower, said in a California Management Review article, I would like to see the new generation of business leaders embrace that tried and true ethical litmus test. If a transaction or activity will not pass muster on the front page of the Wall Street Journal, then just don't do it. In our capitalist system, we rely on the proper disclosure of financial and operating information in order to have proper allocation of resources among businesses. The drug company with a new and important discovery enjoys a higher stock price 
giving it access to funds to develop and bring that drug to market. Similarly, a company with a product line that's gone stale sees its stock price decline. We send a message by economically rewarding those companies that are outperforming their peer group and vice versa. To report misleading financial results is dishonest and amounts to nothing, nothing less than theft. There can be no successful capitalist system without trust. We expect honesty in our everyday business dealings. On the positive side of this, it seems to me that the notion of shared corporate values, what many writers mean when they refer to corporate culture and values, is at the heart of the issue. I argue, then, the solution to this problem is to teach values and to adopt values-based views of firms. Business ethics is about integrity and authenticity of the enterprise. Accordingly, to be ethical is to truly add value, to follow the cultural values of the corporation, value to its owners, employees, and customers. Those who cannot serve others and communicate the values are not authentic leaders. Those who do not follow the values are not ethical in a business sense. According to Bill George, the former CEO of Medtronic and author of Authentic Leadership, he says, we need authentic leaders, people of the highest integrity, committed to building enduring organizations. We need leaders who have a deep sense of purpose and who are true to their core values. We need leaders who have the courage to build their companies to meet the needs of all their stakeholders and who recognize the importance of their service to society. The tyranny of the bottom line. The logic that business has one and only one responsibility to enhance shareholder wealth is a basic tenet of some business disciplines. Few business students complete their degrees without hearing the quote from Milton Friedman that business is responsible to shareholders only that the firm has one and only one responsibility to shareholders. This is one of the most pervasive doctrines promulgated in business schools. However, it is arrogant and elitist. It is also dangerous and out of touch with reality. This is not to say that making shareholders happy is not a good thing. It is. It's just not the only important thing. There are so many problems with this logic about shareholders only that it's difficult to know where to start. Perhaps the first problem to point out is that it doesn't square with the legal history of this country. Author Marjorie Kelly in The Divine Right of Capital and Ralph Estes in The Tyranny of the Bottom Line argue that the supremacy of shareholders as a legal theory has more in common with the right of kings than of corporations. Rather, states like Iowa grant corporate charters and our country's state laws are based on the notion that a corporation is granted the right to exist based on its contribution to society. Firms are granted charters because they potentially pr provide some needed product, good, or service, not initially to serve shareholders. In other words, sociological theory of structural functionalism has more to do with the existence of firms than the myth purported by Dr. Friedman. In Marjorie Kelly's words, in order to serve st stockholders well, you have to serve other stakeholders well. Furthermore, what does it mean to enhance or maximize the interest of shareholders in the first place? Shareholders are almost always considered to be a monolith in business teaching, a large group with homogenous interests. This is simply an unwarranted assumptions, assumption. Shareholders come and go. The average share of stock in the United States, according to the Harvard Business Review, is held for less than a year. Warren Buffett's reason for holding shares is not the same as a day trader. Kreff has different goals in holding shares from an arbitrage firm. Read your Kreff statements. The stated purpose of Kreff is to facilitate a multiplicity of investor goals. You and I may hold shares of Harley-Davidson stock. You have shares because Harley is a great investment. It's Fortune Magazine's top transportation firm but I have shares because I like V-Rods, Night Trains, and Fat Boys. The simple point is to assume homogenous goals among shareholders is unwarranted. Which leads me to the last problem, shareholder supremacy. Real practicing managers don't believe it. They do not live it. Fortune Magazine's most admired firms are judged according to a variety of criteria, including, including innovation, quality products, and community responsiveness. 
I know of no executive leading a large, major, successful firm who has ever echoed the statement of Mr. Friedman. Take, for example, this quote. Financial returns are neither a right nor a prerequisite for doing business. They are an outcome, your reward for serving the customers well. Once you've demonstrated your value to customers, they will determine the return to which you're entitled. Whenever I see a company whose strategic plan is expressed only in terms of financial goals, I sell the stock. This statement was made by Matt Klingler in a Management 582 class session on corporate leadership. Mr. Klingler is a former John Deere executive, a friend of ISU, and now runs a successful engineering consulting firm. Ask any practicing manager if their responsibility can be viewed in terms of only one stakeholder group. Ask President Joffrey or Professor Ben Allen if they view their responsibility only in terms of one responsibility, only regents, not journal editors, grant providers, students, families, employees, etc. Wealth creation can result from a variety of value propositions, not just the exclusive one decried by Dr. Friedman. Again, there's nothing wrong with making shareholders wealthy, but focusing only on them tends to lead to a short-term orientation, to simplistic evaluations, to a lack of awareness of the task environment of the firm. It also leads to sub-optimization of other important functions. Looking at share price only can lead to neglect of true profitability, capital structure, innovation, customer and employee satisfaction. Pressure from Wall Street analysts can actually be destructive. The simple irony is that shareholder-only perspectives almost always lead to less shareholder value, while stakeholder or multidimensional effectiveness views lead to better performance for shareholders. See Blackburn, Dorn, and Schrader, 1994. Wasn't it Al Dunlap who gutted R&D capabilities and governance structures and weakened Sunbeam to the point of near collapse in the name of shareholders only? And didn't Al say there is only one constituency I'm concerned about, and that is the shareholders? This quote, along with Dunlap's hubris, prompted Al, Patzing Al Petzinger of the Wall Street Journal to title an article, Does Al Dunlap mean business, or is he just plain mean? Ask any system, excuse me, any system that emphasizes one performance criterion at the exclusion of others will probably fail as a system. Recent research on organization failure by Sidney Finkelstein in Why Smart Executives Fail indicates that adherence to a single item performance measure at the expense of others often leads to failure of the whole system. Use our academic institution as an example. We now purport to use a balanced set of measures of scholarship based on the collective works of Boyer to include discovery, dissemination, and integration. All three add value in terms of scholarship. We did this because it made organizational sense. However, there remain some who hold that, for example, research is the only criterion by which we should be evaluated. Teaching and service do not matter. Imagine the effectiveness of an institution such as ISU if truly only one thing mattered. Solutions for tyranny of the bottom line problem are straightforward. Recognize and reward all contributions to the overall value proposition. Put differently, acknowledge and support those who add value. One option is the balanced scorecard. The balanced scorecard is a management technique that allows firms to map strategy in terms of various contributions to value. The term balance indicates that various performance criteria are part of the overall firm effectiveness. The scorecard includes four key performance areas, financial performance, innovation and new product development, employee growth and learning, and customer satisfaction. Any one, all, one, two, or some of these can be made priorities, but all are seen as important. Each supports the others. Long-term success and organizational health are the outcomes. Companies such as Wells Fargo, Edward Jones, Pella Windows, Cisco Systems, and Principal Financial Group use the balanced scorecard idea. Responsible managers embrace the complexity of management and acknowledge various contributions toward effectiveness. We now teach the balanced scorecard in the MBA program. It could easily be, easily be applied to nonprofit and government organizations. Wrong assumptions, wrong theory. Research indicates that firms exhibiting sustained success on a number of performance criteria 
are typically great organizations first and not so much the result of a charismatic or superstar CEO. Good companies are just that, good organizations, not the result of an individual manager superstar. In the current October issue of the Harvard Business Review in an article devoted to new CEOs, it states, CEOs must recognize that ultimately it is only the long-term profitability that matters, not today's growth expectations or even stock price. CEOs can easily lose their legitimacy if their vision is unconvincing, if their actions are inconsistent with the values they espouse, or if their self-interest appears to trump the welfare of the organization. The problem here, here again is that we often place too much importance on the self-interest or on self-interest in business school teaching. Self-interest is seen as very important. Several mainstream theories assume self-interest to be the prime source of motivation. One such theory is agency theory. The basic tenets of agency theory go something like this. Agency transactions exist when persons hire other persons as decision-making specialists to perform services. In other words, shareholders or principals hire managers or agents to make decisions. But this creates a problem because of the potential for managerial opportunism or self-interest with guile. Top managers may make strategic decisions to maximize their personal welfare and minimize their own risks. It is not possible for principals to know which agents will act most opportunistically. So we assume all will, most within reason, but some with guile. Thus, the principles establish governance and control mechanisms to prevent self-interest. What great theory. We assume self-interest and organize accordingly. How liberating and motivating. We treat relations and organizations as transactions and problems to be solved. Imagine how noble to walk into a board meeting as a manager and be immediately perceived as a problem. And I suppose the agency cycle is never really broken, right? Because managers are the agents of the board and the agents are the, of the, who are the agents of the shareholders who are the agents of the agents' agents. In short, we are all self-interested and must be watched. So our entire social fabric is resulted from this problem. What's more, it seems to me that research testing agency transactions can never be wrong. In my view, most papers published purporting to be tests of agency problems start off with some sort of guess about what constitutes self-interest. When the findings do not obtain, which they often don't, the researchers conclude it must not have been in the agent's self-interest in the first place. Holy teleology, Batman. <laughs> Agency theorists can never be wrong. All good stuff to share with business students who will be going out and building real organizations and working with others. And like some of the other assumptions we teach, agency assumptions do not seem to hold in the real world. A colleague of mine at Purdue, Holly Brower, and I published a paper in the Journal of Business Ethics a few years ago, and one of our general conclusions was that board members and top managers desire to act as stewards rather than agents. Stewards accept responsibility. Our sample included some managers who are in this audience tonight. Try this. Ask any share owner if they would rather the managers of their firm act like agents or stewards. I'm willing to take a guess as to what they might say. Plus, agency theory does not do a good job with what Bowie and Freeman call the multiple principle problem, which is in effect the same issue as the assumption of homogenous shareholders mentioned earlier. The point is that the assumption of a clear agency problem is probably assuming too much. Addis additionally, according to Bowie and Freeman, agency theory assumptions are similar to the religious concept of original sin. We start off guilty. It assumes the worst about human behavior. At best, agency theory helps explain significant wrongdoing because of the self-interest with guile assumption, but it does not seem to do a good job for normative theory or what should be. The solution is teaching more stewardship theory, upper echelons theory, decision maker choice theories, group decision making models, attribution theory, anything that will move us away from self-interest and toward an understanding of how politics, responsibility, and collective human aspirations collide in complex human interactions. You know, one big problem I have with this view personally is that agency theory does not view managers as responsible. 
any, and, and personally in my own value system, I view any form of agency as requiring significant personal responsibility for outcomes. I also view management as the discipline of responsibility. Managers are by definition responsible. I love this quote by Joseph Badaracco, who teaches at Harvard. This is from his book, Defining Moments. Managers are the ethics teachers in their organizations. This is true whether they are saints or sinners, whether they intend, whether they intend to teach ethics or not. It simply comes with the territory. Actions send signals and omissions send signals. Almost everything does. Hence, responsible managers are concerned about their roles in the defining moments of their organizations. They care, that is, how their decisions and actions reveal, test, and shape the character of their companies. My sense is that deans, chairs, and provosts would rather have faculty stewards who desire responsibility than agents who need monitoring. I view myself as a steward. When given a teaching assignment, my dean and my chair do not need to monitor me. I try to act as a trustee of the college and the department. One final thought on agency theory. Our college is in the process of strategic planning. And in this process, we are asking ourselves, what do we want to be known for? Or better said, for what, for what do we wish to be known? And we have great deliberations over what functions, disciplines, and subdisciplines we should emphasize. Let's be known for finance or transportation or supply chain, all very good options, and any would probably be fine as research areas. But try to envision what outcomes would be like if we were to become the agency school of business, that all teaching and research were based exclusively on agency assumptions. Here's a future dialogue between a recruiter and an ISU school of agency graduate, recruiter and graduate. Recruiter, tell me, Harvey, why should we hire you here at Colossal Financial Services? Agency graduate, well, I'm a finance major with a specialization in used, refriger used, <laughs> used refrigerator pricing on eBay. I know where the net present value and internal rate of return buttons are on my calculator. I'm accomplished at responding to multiple choice questions and increasingly narrow applications of the cap.